Hi everyone, welcome back. So today we're going to look at a new form of a multiplayer add-on. I've already been working on uh, my multiplayer library, this is an interface for it. This addresses some of the problems with the previous version of the add-on, which was that it wasn't particularly extensible, neither was it particularly functional, and it used quite a lot of bandwidth. All in all, it was a little bit temperamental, and it was a good starting point, but at this, at this stage in development, it makes more sense to provide the user with more, uh, more controls, and just to ensure that they're user-friendly enough that they are optional where needs be. So you'll notice that we have a number of panels on the left-hand side, and equally we have a new panel in the world settings called networking. So this panel is particularly self-evident. Um, you can check the network mode. You can also set the uh, host address to bind the current network socket to. Also, you can set the port to bind the socket to, the tick rate, and the sample rate for the network metrics, which may or may not be exposed to the user interface. On the left-hand side, we have RPC calls, network state, replicated attributes, and templates, and most of these are self-evident. We're going to go through them sequentially, and we're also going to look at some of the ways in this can be extended and used. The first thing of note is this dispatcher. It's an entity, or rather, it's an empty, and its purpose is to intercept messages, hence the message sensor, and forward them into the network system. This is the only logic brick that the system is forced to support because of the fact that there is no API for messages uh, on the game object. So don't mess with this, and it's best to actually move it or hide it so you don't see it. Now, our cube is a default cube. It has nothing special about it apart from it did have a game property that I've just deleted. Uh, so this can be used in the system as is. At the moment, it won't be registered as part of the network system due to the fact that it doesn't have any network data. So Let's actually start with replicated attributes because these are the most con common sense uh, part of the system that you're being familiar with. If we add a game property, you'll notice we get a new replicated attributes entry. Currently, this is all grayed out, and for the uh, benefit of being able to see this more clearly, I'm going to actually disable the visibility of the pr property if it's not enabled, or at least grayed out, which also turns out to be not possible, so that solves that issue. You can tell that it's disabled because this uh, text input field is grayed out, and also the volume spe uh, speaker icon is also empty, or it doesn't have the uh, aspect to it that shows that it's loud. It shows it's muted, that's the word that I'm looking for. Okay, so you can see the name of the property, you can see this text box, and you can see the muted state, and if you enable the property, you'll see this text uh, input field is called name of notification group, and this refers to uh, the notify aspect of the system, which we'll come on to later. So this attribute is now being replicated as part of the network system, and you can add a couple more if you'd like, and they can also be enabled as necessary. And if we remove them, they'll be removed from this list. So the notify aspect um, is used to trigger events when properties are changed by the server. The purpose of this is that you can actually group a number of properties under a single notification group, so that if any of those are changed, you can receive a message to indicate that as the state. You could also use a property sensor to detect when properties are changed by the server, but this would also uh, detect changes locally, and you'd have to have a multiple number of sensors in order to detect multiple changes, even if they are all identical in their functionality. For example, if the X or Y or Z attributes were changed, that would indicate a position changed, but if you did it manually, you'd need to have three independent property sensors. With this, you could have them all belong to the position group. So that's basically replicated attributes in a nutshell. Now, RPC calls are a similar beast. If we hide the properties for now, you'll see that I can only see prop zero in this RPC call arguments list, whilst I can see prop. If I enable the prop zero as replication, you'll see it disappears, and that's because we don't allow RPC calls to use properties which are currently in use by the replication system. This is convention, you could still use them, but they would probably lead to bad design where if that ever scenario was needed. RPC calls are basically defined as a name, a target, some data about their state, and any arguments. Now, arguments that are, are basically game properties which are uh, copied back to the server or client, whoever you're sending to, when the argument RPC call message is triggered. So the name is used to invoke the RPC call, the target is used to detect where it goes, and then the reliable and simulated options are as they are in the network library, which basically dictates whether or not we should force the message to get through, and whether or not the uh, RPC call can be run on certain types of game objects. 
So you can also set these those booleans in the uh, drop down UI, so the, the list UI, uh, as you can in quite a lot of areas of Blender. So in terms of how we use RPC calls, let's actually look at that now. If you want to receive an RPC call or send an RPC call, simply create a message sensor and prefix it with RPC underscore. Then you can put the name of the function, in this case a function, and that will be triggered when the RPC function is invoked on this this particular machine, on this particular game object. Likewise, you do the same for sending. If you want to receive a notification of when a notification group has been changed, create a message sensor and give it the prefix notify and then the name of the property group. In this case we could have position and then we would create let's rename our properties to x, y and let's go to z. We're going to call this position and these will all trigger that notification group. One thing the system has a limitation with is if we add a new property to demonstrate this. If you rename the property but you've got some information set on it, for example, I have a false notification group and I have it replicating. If I rename this to prop D, you'll notice that it causes some issues. In fact, I actually managed to discover a bug there which caused other problems. Um, what I'm intending to demonstrate was actually that um, if I quickly reload this add on, uh, I'm going to fix this. Prop D, hopefully I can then do it. Maybe not. What I was attempting to demonstrate was that um, if you rename a property and it has stuff set on it, um, like this, it clears the settings um, because it can't detect that you've renamed it. Only, it only detects that it's disappeared from the property list. I may be able to fix that if I can work out whether these are unique, um, but for now we can't. So let's just undo that. There are some places where uh, edit undo might fail, so be careful with that. Let's just refresh this a little more and label these. Position, position. Great. So um, be careful uh, in this early stage at least. Now, if we uh, add some more properties and the prop 0 and prop 1 and check these as arguments, these can be sent with the RPC equal function, which is being sent to the server. And we are currently a server, so this would actually be executed locally. If we change it to client, you'll see that this now works on, will be sent to the client and it will send these two properties. So that's basically RPC calls. In terms of um, how they work, we'll look at how that works later. Network state is a means of forcing logic to run on certain machines only. Uh, in the current add-on, you have basically two different objects that are added. In this version of the add-on, you only have one. Um, so rather than adding an entity object, um, what it will do is it will add the same type of object. Uh, you don't specify an entity name like you do in the old add-on. Uh, or a proxy as it's also known. Um, it adds the same object that was sent over the network and you, it can select a different state depending on whether you're the server or the client. In fact you can set a group of states. So by default the client runs on state 0 and the server on state 1. I may change this. Um, if you want to select your own states, simply make them visible. In this case let's make this, this block of states uh, belong to the, the client. Uh, we select them, select the client network state and click this refresh button. You'll see that this list of states is now selected. And now if we switch to these visible states and then select the server and click refresh, you'll see that these are now entirely different and they belong to the various different states. This is a good way of sharing logic where necessary but also limiting it where not. Um, for example, if you had um, some basic logic like collision detection that works on the server and the client, you'd simply share that um, on a state that was that was activated on both machines. Whilst if you had logic that can only run on the server, then you'd stick that in a server state. The way that this works is when the game starts, any states which are in, in initialized or checked, which aren't enabled under the current network state, are unset. But if you activate any other states which aren't described by that state, for example, you activate a state 16, which doesn't have a network state, then that is not affected. At the moment, this isn't forced upon you. You can still change the state during the game um, because there's no real point in forcing use that's belligerent. Um, but we may or may not undo that as, as, as we see fit. Um, so that's basically network state. Now, templates are a means of extending the system. Uh, they allow you to create base objects which can be then shared between different users. 
So in this case, um, a template can basically do all of the above. It can de declare replicate attributes, RPC calls. Um, it cannot declare network states, but that's basically a non uh, object. Uh, that doesn't belong to the object as much as the actual game object in question. So to define a template, let's create a new file. I'm going to call it actors.py. I'm going to import the base class for network objects. I'm going to create a class example obj that's going to inherit from the clickable, and we're going to save it. Now what we're going to do is we add a new template um, called actors, and you'll see that it now shows us the classes that are available in this module. In this case, we have custom actor, and if we check that, that will enable us to use that particular class. So um, this allows you to declare more advanced things, more advanced code and so on, and potentially more efficient code um, without doing it all in a, in, a hot, in a constrained user interface. In addition to this, um, it would allow you to dictate more specifically when replicated attributes are sent over the network. You have access to more information um, like the current object state, as well as whether it's the first time this has been sent over the network, and also whether the current object is actually controlling the object in question. Uh, that information is useful in certain optimization scenarios. Now, to actually support that uh, through a template, I need to add a special switch that disables um, the condition statement if it's not relevant. Um, in a, uh, if, if, for example, if you want to override it, because at the moment the network code um, generated by the GUI will run atop any of the template classes in question. Um, so that's basically that. Now. This is a much more functional system, um, but it has its caveats. And that is that it's a little bit more confusing to use. Um, but then the previous system had its quirks. Hopefully, this user interface is a lot more user friendly um, and doesn't do things as weirdly um, and doesn't force you to look at things like how often things are sent um, because you can actually now dictate that. <coughs> so, here we have an example game, very, 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 very simple. Uh, and it's just, just to demonstrate why certain things are useful. I've added a new button to view the states that are selected by um, the network state option and at the moment this requires you to hover your mouse over the logic window in order for it to refresh. Um, so on the server state, uh, let's get to the client first. Um, the client receives a message called uh, notify on hurt which is set when the attribute called health is updated uh, and what this will do, notify hurt sorry, this will then trigger an action which could be a wincing animation uh, and this will run on all clients that receive this um, RPC call, sorry, this uh, notification of the variable. Now on the server, on the server, whenever we collide with another player, by the property player, we trigger uh, an apply damage which modifies the health on the server. So what happens is once a collision occurs, we modify the health, which then modifies the replicated attribute, which is then sent to the client, and the client receives the message and modifies and plays an animation. And that is a very basic example, so uh, I'll keep you guys posted with the development, uh, but for now stay tuned.